Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So, in the last class, we were talking about mercantilism and the debate surrounding the mercantilist claims about money supply in the economy and how it was a stimulant and how after a couple of hundred years of facing criticism, the mercantilist argument eventually got its very powerful revival in the hands of John Maynard Keynes. What I shall do now is to wind up the debate on mercantilism by concluding with the positions taken by on the one hand home as a critique and on the other hand the defense of mercantilism probably the best defense by James Stewart. So, we will do the uh, home Stewart debate which I am looking at as a kind of a postscript to what we have studied about mercantilism earlier. Now, as we have seen the period of mercantilism was between the middle of 16th between the middle of the 16th century to the middle of 18th century. This was a period when two things happened in Europe. One thing is strong nation states had been formed all of which had been controlled and all of which had been ruled by auto autocratic strong monarchies. And these monarchies had the backing of the mercantile interests of these economies which are growing stronger and stronger through this period. So, there was a kind of a class collusion between the ruling class of the monarchies and uh, the economically powerful bourgeoisie in the towns, the traders and the manufacturers, exporters mainly. So, it is this collusion, it is this collaboration between these two groups that eventually led to the dominance of mercantilists for about 300 years. The second thing is that we have the argument for free trade breaking out open by the middle of the 18th century very strongly, very aggressively as a part of an overall stimulation for the whole society to think in terms of different kinds of freedoms. This was a period when the idea of political freedom and liberties took strong hold after the writings of John Locke and also a number of French interest groups, French intellectuals who were all in favor of intellectual freedom and the freedom of thought. So, you had an environment and ethos virtually in this period which was talking about freedom. It was a part of this that the ideas grew up as we shall see in the next session about free trading economies as some kind of natural order. So, as the argument for natural order of free trade grew stronger and stronger through the 18th century by the 1780s virtually mercantilism of all forms had become history. A period of 30 years really put paid to 300 years of varied and assorted mercantilist arguments. So, what we are seeing today is a kind of a postscript in the sense the finest criticism of mercantilism as it came through home and the finest defense of mercantilism about 15 years after home through the writings of James Stewart. We already know that there were four broad fronts through which home made us critique what we will do now is to quickly sum it up and see what these 
arguments are. Can somebody tell me what this price specie flow mechanism is? Krishna? Sorry, Species. you got to go off the mute mode. I am not able to recall it properly. Right? Oh, okay. So, Species. mute is fine for that. Species. Specie refers to metal or gold. Beautiful. And specie flow? Specie flow would then price. be money flow. like. Excellent. So, what is it all about? So, um, this was related to what um, the, what the <coughs> mercantilists believe that they believe that uh, at all costs you should keep the wealth with you and at, co at all costs you should keep the money with you. So when you're trading, uh, say with another country, you should uh, you should encourage your traders to pay them in kind, and take payments in uh, gold gold from well. them. Okay, that's lovely. So in other words, conserve the bullion in your hands, if possible, add to it through trade surplus gains. Am I right? Okay, so. Holmes' critique against this was simply that importation of gold will increase the volume of money in supply and it might lead to a small amount of real gain, but fundamentally it will only reverse the whole thing because what will happen is the cost of domestic manufacturers would rise with more money in circulation, which would mean that domestic industry would lose its competitive advantage with which it has been making trade surplus. And when this competitive advantage is lost, in other words, when the prices of domestic manufacturers are rising to equal the price of imports or sometimes cross the price of imports, then all that happens is that the entire advantage in trade is lost. So, specie flow at best is a short term palliative which seems to stimulate money supply in the economy and it might have a real benefit in the sense a little bit of real benefits to occur when money supply increases, but eventually what will happen is this will end up pushing up the prices and inflation which in turn would make the domestic industry lose its comparative or competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis imports. So, Holmes' argument was specie flow mechanism ensured that basically bullionism is not really a gain. Addition to bullion in the economy is not really a gain. It, there is a tendency for balance of trade to be continuously equilibrated through gold transfers. Hmm? This is this criticism of home is in conformity with modern notions of balance of payments, where transfer of not so much liquidity, but transfer of assets is said to compensate for trade deficit or surplus. For instance, if I have a trade deficit with another country then the other country has an option of buying up assets in my country in place of the money which I owe the other person. In other words, a transfer of assets takes place. So, one flow in balance of trade statement which is a trade deficit I am importing more than I am exporting is compensated by a counter flow in the capital account of balance of payments, whereby there is an inflow from abroad into this country. So, eventually this offsets the other and balance of payments remains as it was before in balance. However, a current account flow is countered by a capital account flow within the balance of payments. This is a modern technique and in order to ensure that this process, this mechanism is uh, working properly, the United Nations, not so much the United Nations, but the International Monetary Fund, which was part of the Bretton Woods Agreement, was established 
precisely in order to finance these short term flows of funds to offset balance of payments disequilibria. So, you can see that there is considerable modernity in the idea of home. The flow of gold or assets or cash as the case may be is only an offsetting flow which offsets balance of trade disequilibria and restores balance of payments equilibrium. This was basically the power of the price spacey flow mechanism argument. If you would like you can make a loan to this. Now, the quantity theory is a further development of this basic argument in spacey flow mechanism, whereby it is argued that in the quantity equation, you remember the quanti quantity equation is m v equals p t, p being price, t being the number of transactions. So, p t is the total or systems aggregate demand for money, is not it? m is the stock of money and v is the velocity with which this money is doing its rounds. So, together they constitute the flow and stock definition of money supply. So, m v is the aggregate money supply and in an identity form the money market is said to be in equilibrium or tending to equilibrium most of the time, because the stocks and flows of money are adjusting to the aggregate demand all the time. Now, this is broadly the quantity theory and therefore, what happens in this is according to Ohm, any addition to money supply will have a short term real benefit in the sense that it will stimulate domestic production, because more money supply comes into the system and it means more spending is possible and people spend more. So, so far the he goes with the mercantilist argument of bullionism, but he says this is only short lived, because after a while the prices start rising and the benefit in terms of expanded production vanishes. So, eventually the money market is in equilibrium once again at higher prices. Right? So, this is the quantity theory argument and therefore, while the spacey flow argument dealt especially with the balance of payment side of the problem, the quantity theory dealt with the money market in the economy as a whole. The effect of both of them were to say that the real sector of the economy only needed real stimulants. It could not work in the long run on the basis of monetary stimulants and that was the thrust of Holmes argument through the spacey flow and quantity theory arguments. Now, the area where Home really struck hard at the mercantilist argument is their assumption that the possibilities of global trade expansion were only finite. They thought that you know the world is a pretty small place, so in which for somebody to become a big cat he had to shoulder out the smaller cats. In other words, some kind of predatory attitude is necessary for you to prosper through trade. This was the mercantilist argument essentially because of their assumption that the possibilities of expansion of global trade were finite. This was the heart of it, no? You remember this? So, Holmes says who said the possibilities are finite? Because when there is free trade, every country has a growth impetus set into it. So, as countries have free trade, there is greater exchange activity going on, there is greater production in all the countries and therefore, greater exchange acti activity. So, it is a kind of a spiral which enables economies to move up on a growth path, which basically means the mercantilists were faulty in their first assumptions namely that the total trade possibilities in the world economy are finite. Home says then who says they are finite. So, given free trade there is growth and when there is growth 
production possibilities grow and therefore trade possibilities grow and more production possibilities and a spiral which takes you upwards. So, this was Holmes argument third argument about fundamentally unlimited possibilities of expansion of the world market through free trade. Here again Holm was a precursor to a lot of arguments made since 1980s across the world market where it has been argued that if trade is liberalized, if countries across the world liberalize the trade as a part of a deregulation program which means you cut down tariff across the board, stimulate imports from one another, this stimulates cheaper cost of production across the world and this in turn stimulates growth and more exports in short a growth based trade based growth is what has been argued across the world since 1980 as a part of the global economic reform program. You can see that this argument goes right back to home. He was the earliest one to make this argument. The last of the four major arguments of Home related to rate of interest. This was a counter by him to ever so many mercantilist arguments about the government's the need for government policy to keep interest rates low. The common sense argument why they wanted this is as follows. Growing, growing trade which leads to surplus and then to growth. So, growing trade needs to be financed and if the money for growing trade across the world is available cheaper and cheaper to that extent it is an incentive for trade to grow even more. So, it was basically a mercantile argument cheaper interest breeds cheaper financing of trade and cheaper financing of trade would mean faster growth in trade. This is basically the common sense of it. Now, Holm said money supply had nothing to do with interest rates after all the mercantilists believed that if the government through policy kept the interest rates low then it would mean cheaper and plenty of money supply would be available to the trading community. Now, Holmes says this is not true. He says interest rates cannot be artificially regulated by the government to enable increase in money supply because he says interest rates are a real phenomenon in the sense that as growth occurs investment expands. As investment expands return on capital comes down simply because there is more and more and more investment return on capital comes down which means people are willing to pay less and less to borrow funds which is the reason interest rates come down. So, he says the coming down of interest rates it is a real phenomenon it is not a monetary phenomenon it happens due to real growth in the economy and it is coming down does not mean that money supply is going to increase because he said this is a demand related factor that is in the market for investable funds there is less and less demand for investments because the return on investment is coming down because investments 
are growing, the capital structure is expanding, capital accumulation is going on. So, for all these reasons interest rates, interest rates drop and that is it. It has got nothing to do with government policy keeping interest rates low. He says governments do not have to do that at the growth process and the market mechanism ensure this. Now, there is a major argument here which later became the heart of classical and neoclassical economics right up to Keynes. It has always been argued up to Keynes that interest rate is a real phenomenon, it is not got anything to do with money. That is nominal interest rates were not really the heart of the problem in economics according to classical and neoclassical economics. It is a real rate of interest which makes a difference because this real rate of interest which is influenced by such factors as weighting. You see you give the money to somebody to make an investment you wait for the period of gestation of investment to start yielding. So, it is weighting and the Austrian argument was that there was a time preference involved. That is you give money to somebody and you take money back at a later stage. So, there is some discount involved here and the compensation which you get for lending the money should be at least equal to the rate of discount. So, there are a number of factors in classical and neoclassical economics which were strongly urging that interest rates are real phenomenon and not monetary. This argument that interest rates are real and not monetary again appear to have their origins in this argument of Ohm about interest rate and the capital market. Would you like me to clarify something on that? So, can I go on? Now, about 15 years after Holm had published what he published on this issue, James Stewart made a response. Now, James Stewart is acknowledged as a mercantilist, but it seems to me that he was a visionary, that he was a lot more than simply a mercantilist, because as we shall see in about 20 minutes time. James Stewart was actually also a growth theorist, one of the earliest ones. He was trying to explain different stages in the economic growth of an economy. I do not think anybody did that before him. So, he was a visionary who used the mercantilist analysis to make a policy recommend or make a series of policy recommendations. So, let us look at what James Stewart had to say. The first thing he did was to reject quantity theory and he along with others made the following contention. In the quantity equation which is m v equals p t according to Ohm, m and p became crucial independent and dependent variables. In other words as m moves the dependent variable is p variable is p and p goes up and down on an inverse relationship between m and p no. Yeah? Now, what Stewart said is the quantity theory argument forgets the fact that there is something else which is happening in the economy. Every pound or dollar or rupee which is a stock of money is not simply going around. Suppose for instance a dollar or a pound or a rupee changes hands 6 times. right? So, in terms of velocity you would say it changes hands 6 times during the day. So, velocity, velocity daily velocity is 6. So, the total value of money is not just 1 pound, but 6 pounds. Am I right? Now, one thing which this argument overlooks is this that it does not do 6 rounds in a day, it may do more, it may do less. In between the time it moves from one hand to another, 
it stays unmoving in the hands of people. For instance, five of the six transactions might be over by 10 o'clock in the morning. And they may sit in the hands of somebody till 7 o'clock in the evening. And at 7.15, this man performs the last or the sixth transaction. So, in terms of velocity, you say it did six rounds in the day, it's six rupees. But if you actually look at this, between 10 in the morning till 6 in the evening, the money was idle. It was not moving, isn't it? So, there is there's not only flowing money, there is also idle money in the system. So, this idle money, which is not flowing, it is the inverse of velocity. Am I not right? It is called holding. So, up to 10 o'clock, the velocity is 5. Then, from 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock, velocity is 0. And then at 6 o'clock, the velocity is 1. Am I not right? But between 10 and 6, the money was holded. Am I right? So, how many rounds the money does during the day also depends upon the periodicity of stagnation of money in people's hands, not flowing, holding. Am I right? So, Stewart was conscious of this factor of holding among other countries. So, Stewart said if holding increases, velocity drops. If holding decreases, that is people are removing money from their private stocks and releasing it into circulation it is de holding. De holding happens velocity increases. So, he says money market adjustments are happening all the time because people are constantly holding and de holding money in accordance with what they need at that time whether they, whether they need cash which they need to release from the holding or the, whether they want whether they have extra cash which they want to just hold and keep away. In other words, the behavior with respect to holding is a crucial factor which determines the velocity of money supply. So, he says if this is the case, then how can you correlate money supply with just price? Because the adjustments in between money supply and demand is actually happening with holding and deholding. When there is an excess money supply, according to quantity theory, prices should rise. But according to Stewart, it will simply lead to more hoarding. If there is too much money on hand, people will simply put it away instead of spending it on goods. So, he says that just because people have more money in hand, it does not mean they spend it. It does not mean that it leads to a price increase. It may simply go into their pockets for, a, for, a, for another day spending. So, holding increases. So, according to Stewart, velocity of money supply in the M V equals P T is a crucial variable and that goes up or down according to whether there is holding happening or disholding happening. And holding or disholding happening happen when there is a discrepancy between money supply and money demand in the economy. So, when money supply money demand discrepancy happens according to Stewart, it does not simply lead to price increase or decrease as the quantity theory says. He says it simply leads to more holding or less holding or holding or disholding. In which case he says there is no reason why you should accept quantity theory at all. This was probably the most strong case ever made against quantity theory ever in the history of economics. I am not saying that people like Keynes did not make a strong claim against quantity theory. It is true that Keynes had a much wider and much more uh, complex description of the money market than quantity theory could ever do. But till the time of Keynes, one thing which happened which questioned the quantity theory strongly 
was this argument of Stewart and the other mercantilists like him against the assumption that any increase in M would increase would lead to an increase in P because he said any increase in M could simply mean a decrease in V so that the money market removes an equilibrium. So the bringing in of holding as a crucial variable and therefore as a variable which determines the size of V is a major contribution by, by mercantilists as a critique of quantity theory. If you want you can make a note of this. Now one further extension of this argument of holding later on classical and in a large measure neoclassical economic theory accepted holding as an important factor. So quantity theory itself was given two versions subsequently one version which looks at money demand and money supply purely as a function of M V and P T and the other looks upon the total output in the system in place of P T it looks at the output in the system and the money supply is looked upon as a function of some kind of a cash balance which people hold. So the total value of transactions in the Cambridge equation which came later was equal not to velocity time stock but was determined purely by the stock of money which people held. So they said if your income is 1000 rupees you have a tendency to hold say 200 rupees in cash all the time. So the total demand for money you have in the system is only centering around this 200 rupees. You keep this 200 precisely because you will need to spend money. So at any point of time as you spend some money out of this stock which you are having you inject more money into that stock so that you maintain it is like having money in the purse. No? So this version of quantity theory which talks about cash balances rather than velocities was called the Cambridge equation which recognized the holding behavior alluded to by Stewart and his friends. Now the Cambridge equation is simply some, some k times small k times k is a fraction lying between 0 and 1. So some small k times the income if I have an income of 1000 rupees then k fraction of that income is what I hold as cash balance and the total money supply in the economy is only this cash balance is not it. So the Cambridge equation looks at the whole thing from the point of view of cash balance which is nothing but a variation of the holding which Stewart and others had earlier referred to. So because of these arguments because holding is the one which is the cushion in the money market Stewart could argue that money market never went into disequilibrium. It was always in equilibrium because any changes in the value of because P T is a constant according to him the volume of transactions is a, is a function of what was happening in, in the production conditions of the economy and P is the price at which the transactions are happening that is it period. So adjustments are all taking place not between M and P as quantity theory argued but between V and holding. The volume of V increased or decreased as M changed so that one side of money market remained, remained unchanged. So they could argue that money market is, an all, is always in equilibrium it can never be in disequilibrium this was Stewart's argument a very powerful argument. The next argument of Stewart 
was on the level of employment. The aggregate demand for goods and services in the economy could be such that they need not employ every worker who is available in the economy. It might not provide employment for everybody. In other words, what Stewart was arguing was that aggregate demand might be such that it might be below the aggregate supply of goods in the economy. There might be an excess supply, there might be an overproduction of goods. No? When this happens, there is unemployment. Right? If you have a simple production function where you say Q is a function of L, where L is employment, for any increase in Q, you need to increase employment, or better still, as the demand for Q increased, L will increase. And it can go on happening till some L cap or L bar, which will be for employment. No? Yes? You want me to write this down? So, what Stuart argues is that any level of aggregate demand in the system which exists at any point in time need not necessarily ensure that there will be full employment. And to have full employment, you have to have policies oriented towards the wages, right. And like other mercantilists, Stuart also argued that the labor market does not ensure some kind of automatic adjustment of wages according to availability or demand or supply of labor. Here government intervention is necessary. So, how does Stuart look at the system? He says, in an economy which is growing, any change in technology which leads to mechanization, which leads to bringing in of more capital tends to displace labor. Now, when labor is displaced, automatically there is supply, excess supply of workers, wage rates fall. At the same time, the labor market is not by itself adequate to have automatic adjustments which will ensure some kind of an equilibrium wage rate. So, on the one hand you need technological progress, on the other hand you need to ensure that there is no mass poverty or destitution. So, you need a government which is active in this direction, which ensures that subsistence wage is paid to workers in the economy. Now, the big difference is the neoclassical or classical economists would have said any increase in labor supply will go on pushing the wages down till it reaches subsistence, right. But Stuart says the labor market does not work like that. He, for instance, would accept earlier mercantilist arguments. You remember backward bending supply curve, right? Because if wages are slightly above subsistence, there is absenteeism. People do not turn up for work. They earn money in one day, they will not work for two days because they say, okay, I have got enough stock of food for two days. Why should I work? So, labor market at the cr critical point around subsistence wage is a bit indeterminate. You do not know when the fellow is going to turn off from work, when he will return to work. There is a indeterminate, indeterminate space there above subsistence wage, where the supply curve bends upwards. No? So, he says it is one reason why you need an active intervention of government in this situation to ensure that subsistence wage prevails. Like many other mercantilists for instance, he argued that you should not have poor laws, which give some kind of in social security to workers during unemployment. He said you should scrap all the poor laws, so that labor participation in the production process is more complete. So, this as far as labor is concerned, do you have any questions on this?
On the question of subsistence wage, it might be interesting to look at Stewart and his successors among the classical economists. They were all talking of subsistence wage. And towards the end of 18th century, in fact, there was even a theory which was kind of notorious uh, in terms of the implications of justice it had for workers. It was a theory which said the total funds des de designated for the subsistence and living of workers in the economy as a whole was fixed and finite. It was called wage fund. Not because somebody was fixing that so much money should go. It is just that in any production process, a particular proportion of the revenues went for the subsistence of workers. So, according to this theory, the wage funds in the economy are in the long run constant and they provide around subsistence wage rate. But in the short run, demand and supply in the labor market cost the wage rates at any point in time to be above or below the subsistence wage rate. But in the long run, the total funds devolving around so many workers subsistence in the economy at a constant population assumption is constant. So, if population is increasing at a fixed percentage, then wage funds also increase at a fixed percentage. So, the statics and dynamics of subsistence wage theory imply that there is something called a wage fund which sustains workers which is a part of a national income as a whole and this wage fund is constant. It is a, it's a bit of a harsh theory which came under fire in the 19th century considerably from a lot of people who saw the evils of capitalism as being very awesome, gruesome. So, a lot of socialist criticism was against wage fund. A lot of uh, non-socialist criticism of capitalism, liberal criticism of capitalism was also focused substantially on the wage fund theory. But most importantly, probably the most one of the most brilliant of the 19th century followers of Adam Smith, namely John Stuart Mill, his defense of wage fund theory was extremely uncomfortable. He did not have any definitive statement to make on wage funds. He appeared to support wage funds sometimes and other, other times he, is, he appeared to agree with the questioning of wage fund. This is basically because the moral and ethical implications of this wage fund theory were very strong. Much more than the theoretical implications for economics, the moral implications became very crucial and in the 19th century moral questions on capitalism were asked again and again and again even by Karl Marx who could not separate the moral argument about capitalism from the theoretical argument about capitalism which is why in his manifesto of the communist party Marx says workers of the world unite you have nothing to lose but your chains. So, workers of the world unite could be a theoretical proposition, proposition saying that capitalism is falling. So, workers should unite and get together and form a new government that is one. The other is a moral exhortation saying do not worry, there is nothing for you to lose. You are already chained and shackled in capitalism. So, you will only get your freedom when capitalism dies. So, you see this combination of moral and scientific argument as far as the subsistence wage, wage fund theory goes even goes into Marx. I am saying even into Marx because Marx tend to look down upon other socialists as being emotional, utopian and so on and so forth. Well, that is as far as uh, Stewart's argument on wage fund and subsistence are concerned. Now, Stewart backed all this with a very interesting theory of economic growth. Stewart's economic theory of growth assumes that the landed class with the prosperity in agriculture, the landed class would be spending more. 
and also to the prosperity in manufacture growing in the economy the manufacturing class would also spend more but according to steward the spending propensity of the landed class is much more than the manufacturing class because he believed that the manufacturing class would devote its surplus earnings to more production whereas this argument goes later on after steward 2 when they say the landed class doesn't have the motivation to grow bigger than what it is they've got the land they are earning the rent from land and all they need to do is to spend the earnings from rent and enjoy their life so that being the case the real spenders in the economy are the landed class so the as a level of agricultural performance grows as agricultural prosperity starts really happening it's a landed class who become the big time spenders which in turn stimulates the growth process in the economy yes so the first phase of economic growth in the arguments of steward is a domestic market based growth this growth leads to growth of manufacturers and competitiveness among manufacturers and then this competitiveness enables your movement into the second stage where your now growth your growth is now based on trade surplus you might import goods for raw material purposes you might import labor for skill purposes but you do all this to ensure that your surplus in trade by using these resources is growing so in the second phase it is a trade based growth and as this trade based growth goes on and on and on globally other countries in the world also start be getting to be competitive gradually you lose competitive edge in a large number of things which you are exporting it's simply that people are catching up with your technology people are catching up with your investment capacities and resources in short people are getting to be competitive with you as a result your trade surplus starts coming down and then you go to the third stage where the big spurt of growth occurs but entirely based on a very prosperous domestic market so then you don't need trade surpluses to grow as you did in the second stage you probably will still have trade surpluses but your engine of growth is your domestic market due to domestic opulence domestic well being and domestic spending capacity so stewart had this three faced theory of growth if you look at this comparison with some modern theories of growth it resembles some of the modern theories of trade and growth there is a theory called product, product cycle theory which says that the initial spurt of growth happens in a technology in a product domestically and then this technology enables this country to export this product so this country starts earning money by exporting this product and the product grows really fast because it's now found an export market being sent all over the world then in the third stage it's cheaper to set up a factory abroad to manufacture this product than to export it so you make foreign investments of course this part is not in considered at all in stewart's model 
but what happens in the Stewart model uh, in what happens in the product cycle theory comes a time when almost everybody is setting up factories to manufacture this product across the world. That is when your intellectual property rights come to an end. 20 years you hold a patent on it, you initially export the product, then you set up factories all over manufacturing the patented product till finally everybody starts making it. You lose all competitive edge on that. So, you come back to dependency on domestic market for the product. So, there is a similarity between the product cycle theory of trade and Stewart's arguments about the stages of growth. With this we come to an end to this section which we have called a postscript to mercantilism. After the break we shall return and discuss theories of natural order which led to free trade.